This year was a big change for me because last year we came back from India to the US, right? And so the first one we did last year was an experiment. This year, I, my own work has gotten deeper. My ability to transmit has gotten deeper. My clarity on what I'm trying to say in the world is better. So I'm in a very happy place right now, you know? And I think we're at the beginning of something. Um, I don't want to say we're at the beginning of a great, you know, tour of rock band style around the world. No, it's more of a possible movement I'm seeing coming into being where we integrate consciousness, uh, spirituality, mysticism, science, neuroscience, psychology, in a wild, and even psychedelics, in a wild new way that's not been done since Terence McKenna or Alan Watts or all the gurus of the 70s and 80s who used to do that, you know? It's not been done recently. Everybody's become too much into coaching and gurus and you know we need consciousness you know crazy consciousness people out there now again you know if you think back to the 60s and 70s right major revolution you know people were the war in vietnam was a mess the world was a mess you know america was a mess right and soldiers were coming back and it was horrible and people started taking acid for the first time. People started doing psychedelics and marijuana was doing, and the whole hippie culture came into being. So if you were in San Francisco in the 60s or early 70s, it was wild, like New York, you know? Um, and it was all about consciousness. It was all about meditation, but they thought they would change the world. But I don't know if they did, you know? We got some things. We got electric cars, we got, you know, maybe a bit more awareness about food and things like that. But we're on the crisis point of climate change again. I mean, in the biggest way we've ever seen in the history of mankind right now, right? Gender, be, women are not equal still. And we've been talking about it for 70, 80 years. What, what, what the fuck, man? You know? Um, Gays, we're still fighting whether people should be allowed to be married or not, you know, if you're gay or, you know, you know like, uh, psychedelics are still illegal, you know, like <laughs> they should not be, they should be therapeutic or spiritual, right? And religions have nothing to say anymore. I mean, you know, there was a statistic done in the last census, right, that said that 40, 38 to 40 percent of people under 35 do not affiliate to any religion. They're called the unaffiliated. Isn't that a cool name? Unaffiliated, right? That means they may be atheists, they may be mystical, they may be, you know, traveling and doing ayahuasca. They're, it's ex so what we're seeing is that young people like you are looking for experience, looking for awakening, and looking to change the world in a new way that uh, their parents fucked up. You know, because you're inheriting a world that's really screwed up, you know, dysfunctional. It's, things work, you know, the highways work, the airplanes work, the roads work, everything works. But emotionally, psychologically, the world is not a good place right now, you know. I see things skeptically. I look at everything and I see how screwed up we are mentally, you know. Look. My parents' generation, the baby boomers, right? The, the ones who came out of World War II and, you know, 50s and 60s. They, they came out of the worst war man had ever seen, right? And they built new countries, new, you know, industries. And it was a fantastic time, but they tried to raise their kids the best way they could. And those kids became the Gen Xers, whatever they call them. Uh, um, the next, the next generation sort of started questioning, right? But they went into money, capitalism, right? So a whole group went into making 
killer money, the you know, law of attraction, Wall Street, you know, boom, 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 boom. And a small group of that went into psychedelics and, and other things and, and exploration, Beca went to travel in India, became Buddhist monks, Buddhism came here. So Buddhism got really big here. Gurus got really big here, Osho, you know, all the big guys, right? And, but that generation could not fix the world. They actually consumed it more than the, 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 the previous one, you know? So it became a very consumer, me, 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 me culture, all about my consciousness, my awakening, my guru, my food, my business, my capital, you know? It's me stuff, man, that was terrible, right? Now, your generation are their kids, right? And they tried to give them a good life, they tried to do it all, but we've messed up the world quite a bit, our generation, right? So why it's appealing right now is that we are, we're not suicidal, we're skeptical, you know, because you could easily say the world's going to end. It's all over. Oh my God, you know, climate change, nothing's going to happen. But I don't think so. I think we're hopeful that we can fix it, but we have to change our consciousness. Does that make sense? It goes back to that idea that I am, I don't belong to any one creed. I have studied all of them. I have taken from all of them. And my own awakening came from Tantra, from Shakti Tantra, right? And so two things happen. One is that by doing Shakti Tantra, my energy, my ability to transmit, my ability to be a walking beacon of light, a flame in the world, tremendously increased. So now I'm a kind of living embodiment of that right now. And whatever I'm doing, it's working. You know, I'm sharing an energy. I can give it to people. I, when I speak, people love that energy. So I am grateful to the mother goddess for giving me this wonderful gift and all the teachers that gave it to me. Thank you, thank you, thank you, right? The other thing is that I don't speak the old way, right? I speak psychology, I speak humor, I use the F-bomb word, or I F-bomb everything, you know. Nothing is sacred, I'm, I'm an iconoclast, I'll shatter, you tell me something and I'll tell you why it's not what you think it is, you know. I, in, and I've studied every religion, every spiritual practice, every guru in some way or the other, and I can tell you why, what's good about them and what's full of shit about them, you know, it's like the whole thing. And I think that kind of straight talking, fun, humor is critical today. If you don't have it, you know, my favorite comedian is George Carlin, you know, he used to tell you the truth, but make you laugh and wince at the same time. It was like truth can set you free and make you laugh and you can do something. So I want to be like that. I want to be the guy that you come to and you say, shatter the myths for me, you know, tell me the truth, you know. Where did that really come from? Who was that? What does that practice do for me? What does it do to my brain? What's it doing to my neuroscience and my chemistry? Why, why is it fucking me up? You know, and let's talk about it. You know, so if I can talk to neuroscientists and young people and spiritual leaders and bring them all together, I don't want an interfaith dialogue. I want to shatter myths. I want to crack open, you know, they call, they call people like me iconoclasts, right? which means the guy who walks into a temple and breaks the idol, right? <laughs> Icon, I'll break the idol, <clears throat> you know? Okay, that's a bit dramatic. I, I like temples, I like places, they're nice, good energy. But don't fall for the Kool-Aid, don't buy into it. Don't get screwed over by a system, by a guru, by a preacher, by a, don't get, don't give your money, don't go crazy. You have to learn to think for yourself, to be a light for yourself. And so my motto is I'm going to teach you how to be your own guru, how to be a light unto yourself, right? Buddha said it, Krishnamurti said it, Alan Watts said it, and I'm saying it now. So come on, we're in good company, right? We're in good company. So let's say it now, 2022, let's start saying it again and bring that out for everybody, you know? that why did I believe such things? Or why do I believe in anything, right? You have to think about that, right? You have to think, because today, and I think the same was true in the 60s, people don't buy dogma anymore. People don't like to be told what to believe. They want to experience it. They want to taste it. They want to feel divine light. They want to feel 
that power. They want to feel compassion, you know? And I think that we are in an age of experience, exploration, and studying it through the lens of science and neuroscience. Wild time, man. I think it's a beautiful time, you know? I, I actually believe that this is probably the greatest period of consciousness in ever we have seen. Because we've got the internet, we've got neuroscience, we've got AI, we've got religions and spirituality all available now to anybody to study, right? You can just go find them anywhere and watch videos on YouTube. My videos, everybody's videos out there. And so now is the best time to be your own guru, right? It's the best time. But as with everything in life, you need coaching, you need help. You're going to go through weird experiences. You're going to go to the dark nights of the soul. You're going to go through <gasps> ecstatic bliss and wonderful things. You're going to meet people that are going to exploit you. It's going to happen. So what, what you need in times like that are companions and coaches and guides rather than gurus and preachers and priests, you know, you need now to, so we need to create more people like me who are helping people become their own gurus. That's what we need right now, you know. I think that, you know, Krishnamurti was on one extreme end of the perspective of what I'm saying, right? Krishnamurti said that, you know, you have to be the light to yourself, right? You have to be. But he also said, you have to throw away all crutches. You have to throw away all religions, all teachings and everything. Don't follow anything. Think for yourself. And this was back in the 60s and 70s. You know, I mean, it was a radical thinking and nobody could do it. How do you get rid of everything? You can't. And then I, and what I discovered was that I, like that honey bee I talked about earlier with you, where I was like a bee jumping from flower to flower, learning hacks, learning techniques, learning things. I brought them all together. And I realized that there is a process. There's an algorithm to awakening. So the first step is that, can I bring energy into my life, right? So sun gazing, exercising, qigong, martial arts, yoga, integrating all these into a way so that my energy goes right up. So I'm the most vital well I can be, right? Then I take that energy and we convert it into something called Shakti, right? which is an inner power, an inner sacred, divine, feminine goddess power, right? That's in you. And you can do that by breathing, by concentration, by sounds, by mantras. And I teach that too, right? And then I awaken something wonderfully magical that everybody has in them called the Kundalini, the Kundalini Shakti. It's a little ancient energy goddess that lives at the bottom of your spine. And when you start waking her up, she rewires you completely, right? You become a new living Shakti, a living being. So my work is then I take you through that process. And by the time we're done, you end up opening your inner eye in third eye, your intuitive self, and you become this healthy, vital, intuitive, clear being who can now look at everything in a comparative, intelligent way and see what you're meant to do in the world, right? The, the, but the biggest secret of all is that when you open your third eye, it might be spectacular visions, it might be good feelings, it might be everything, right? But the truth is, you go to this state called Turiya, which is kind of like a, like complete tranquility, complete peace, balance. And then from that place, you can redesign reality. Just imagine you're like an artist with a blank canvas and you can turn around and paint a new painting. And that's how your life will change. So that's the steps I take you through in my work. Um, but when I talk, I talk about awakening it now. Thinking about it now. Be awake now. You know, and then Look at all the techniques of all these ancient traditions and look at them in a nice way. Look at them, study them, learn them, but then put them aside and integrate and create your own one. That's when you become your own guru, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so what I discovered in my 24 years of research and experience exploration, it's 24 years I've been doing it now, is that the, the, ex, the limits of human potential, the limits of human consciousness are just unbelievably infinite. 
we can expand and expand our minds and our bodies and our consciousness in ways. And you, you know what I mean. When you jump out of an aeroplane or you ride your bike or you do a ski slope, you're more alive than ever. And most people hardly feel alive anymore. You know, they're, they're looking to want to feel alive. They want to be, they want to feel vital. You know, even if I'm doing a job in the city, I want to feel alive. You know, I don't want to every year have to go and do a ski slope or an ayahuasca trip or something. That's what most people do, right? They go on a little experience trip, then they come back and they're back in their dead end job and their dead end lives and their whatever they're doing. So the first stage is that realize that I want to wake you up to that, that you can break that. And then I want to teach you how you do that. Right. And that's when I'm a coach. I'm a mystical coach. That's a good way of putting it. A mystical coach, right? Uh, you know, because I, I understand the neuroscience of it. I've, I've, I'm working with neuroscientists right now. And so I want to make it as easy as possible for anybody to have, take the red pill and see the truth. But the truth is not that the AI is running the world and we're just batteries in a bat. That's not the truth. The truth is that we are infinite, universal beings taking a ride in this stupid body of ours. And we need to make the body as perfect as we can, but we also need to do amazing expansion of our mind to become who we really are. You know, that's what we're trying to do. My favorite philosophers of our past 50, 60 years were people like Krishnamurti or Alan Watts or Terence McKenna, right? Because Honestly, they never built any schools. They never built any institutions. They, you know, they had a center. You could come and study with them and learn. But it was always lectures and talks or radio broadcasts or whatever. So I realized that, that we need to get this out in social media. We need to get this out in films and videos. We need to get this out in... And there are many people trying to do it now. Esoteric Explorer films and Gaia and things like that. But... My work will be to bring this conversation to as many people as possible, right? And then have intense training systems that we can go and do them with me, right? So, so I'm going to do it through film. I'm going to do it through my work. Because I'm a filmmaker, as you know. I'm going to do it through my films on PBS and international online stuff. I want to do series on these, how people have done it over the centuries and how what we can learn, what the world is going to go through right now. And then I want to talk about it and I want to talk to other great people about this, scientists, mystics, you know, and bring them all together and talk about it, you know, so that in a way we're kind of clearing the slate and rewriting the story. So what's the new story we want to tell? Just like we're telling a new story in, in energy and we want to move towards solar and, 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 you know, just like we're telling a new story in gender, just like we're telling a new story in, in, in whether you're, uh, you know, what your gender is or, of women's rights or anything, diversity and color, you know, we're telling new stories in every part of this thing, right? So we need to tell a new story in mysticism, religion, spirituality, and get, not get rid of the old, but learn and work with it and tell new stories. So I want to be one of the, the pioneers of new storytelling in this next period, you know, and let's play, let's enjoy ourselves, you know. And if we can get young people to just question even for a minute, and have an experience that alters their brain without taking psychedelics. And that was the main thing, was that, as I said yesterday, when I went through the psychedelic experience, the f when I came out of it, the feeling was, I don't want to have to keep going back to the psychedelic to have this experience. I want to be able to do it on my own. And that's what I've achieved, and I want to teach other people to do, you know. I think there are two reasons people like to alter their states of consciousness. One is to escape their meaningless lives, right? And we have to accept that that's a big one. You know, if you're doing a job or a, you're a barista or you're a graphic designer or you're a, you're, you come back every evening and you either go immerse yourself in a video game or you're going to take a psychedelic trip or you're going to microdose or you're going just to survive, you know, it's like a, you know, and because if you turn on the news, you just don't want to live in this country or world anymore. You know, it's like, what the fuck, man? You know, this is screwed up stuff going on, right? So one is escape. 
And it's always been like that. It used to be alcohol and, and marijuana before. Now it's psychedelics and the mushrooms and it's back. Psychedelics are back. Good. The second reason people do it, and that's a smaller group of people, is they want to push the boundaries of their consciousness. So I'm going to start with those people. I, I want to talk to them, right? Who are experimenting to see where it can go. What can it do for my creativity? What can it do for the world? What can it do for me? I want to work with them. So whether if you're doing psychedelics or you're doing mystical practices, you and I are having a conversation, right? And I want to help you achieve those states without psychedelics. That's my mission. It's, I don't want you to stop psychedelics, but I want you to treat psychedelics as sacred medicine that you can use to see open doors, clear your path, and then have a practice that keeps you in that state and growing, right? Psychedelics are not to be banned. They are to be used, but in a sacred way again. And that's the key, you know. The, you know, we, we talk about three worlds we live in in the body, right? It's our reptilian brain, which is our sex, our food, our hunger, our fear, our traumas down there. And then we talk about consciousness and the heart and opening the heart center and feeling love and compassion and empathy for the planet, for each other. And then we talk about opening the third eye, which is the, the upper part of your brain. And, and the opening your third eye to what? To creativity, intuition, clarity, opening possibilities of consciousness, expansion. You know. So when you look at all three, the ancients used to call them Icha Jnana Laya, which means desire, right? That means the lower part of me is always looking to fix something or escape or hide. Then you overcome that and you open your heart and you become human. And then you open your mind and you become super conscious. You become divine. You become a universal being, you know. So that's the journey we take, you know. One of my favorite teachers also was Joseph Campbell. And he was a man who ate steak every night, drank wine, swam, fell in love with a dancer, lived life fully in, in New York and Sarah Lawrence College and then Hawaii and lived to the 90s. And what a full, beautiful life gave us the, the culture that gave us Star Wars with George Lucas. You know, look at the impact he had. And this was no hermit living in a cave somewhere. He was fully engaged in the world, yet fully conscious and opening his consciousness. That's how one should be. In Tantra, we say, be a yogi and a bhogi. A bhogi, a yogi is one who detaches and opens his consciousness, her consciousness to the universe. A bhogi is one who eats the world, loves everything, and through that does the same thing, you know. So wouldn't it be wonderful to just balance the two and be a yogi and a bhogi? I love that. So we should start a new tradition called Bhoga, Bhoga 3.0. <laughs> so we'll have Yoga 3.0 and then your Bhoga. <laughs> and, and also you get to appreciate the crutches in a different way. So I love going to churches and temples and singing songs and all that because my consciousness has moved to a higher level of, not higher as in superior, but broader, wider, you know, deeper. So when I go to a temple, I see the struggle of humanity to try and make sense of it all through the church or through the temple or through the practices or the this. And you feel the pain. You feel why they're doing it. And then you, 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 it really gets you to realize that we, you and I are connected in so many ways, you know. In fact, the tantrics say that we all come from the same one consciousness, right? So how can I see you as bad or good or evil? How can I see anything as good or bad or evil? Because we are all from the same consciousness. What we can see is the pain, the suffering, the blocks, and then heal them, remove them, you know. That's the ideal way. And my, my message is to be your own guru, think for yourself, learn from every great teacher you can find, you know, learn, don't ever stop learning, you know, but be your own guru, be your delight to yourself, be discerning, you know, in, in Tantra, we call it the Hamsa, the Hamsa is a swan, you know, the beautiful white swan, you know, that's the symbol of the higher consciousness, the Hamsa. And why they say, because the Hamsa, the swan, is the only creature 
in the bird kingdom that lives on its own in a kind of with one couple just two of them live together they you don't have many many swans together and they can separate you know stuff bad stuff from good stuff they can drink milk and from water they can take rub food out of muck they can take they can discern everything so the reason to become your own guru to become a hamsa is to be discerning in the world to see truth for what it really is and then then find a path to what you're going to do you know it's a nice way to go thank you